Hi, my name is Caleb Tote, and I will be presenting a portion of the Intel Core i7 Nahala architecture alongside Derek Anderson, Matt Burrow, and Greg Robinson. My portion of the presentation is specifically on the instruction execution. The Nahalem core pipeline can be summarized pretty thoroughly with the following. The early stages of the processor will fetch in several macro instructions, so say in a cache block, and then it will decode them into a sequence of micro operations. The micro operations are buffered at various places where they can be picked up and scheduled to use the uh, functional units in parallel if data dependencies aren't violated. And uh, in the Holland, specifically, micro-ops are issued to stations where they reserve their position for uh, sub subsequent calls. Dispatching as soon as their input operands become available. And finally, completed micro-ops retire and post the results to permanent storage. So the high-level overview of the Nahalem core pipeline is seen right now, and it consists of a few uh, major components. The front end pipeline, which is in order, uses four decoders. The execution engine, which is out of order, and it's the dynamic scheduler. And then the retirement unit, which is um, obviously in order. So if we start with the front end pipeline, it consists of a few major components as well. The first of which is the instruction fetch unit, which consists of the instruction transaction look aside buffer, an instruction prefetcher, the L1 instruction cache, and the pre-decode logic of the instruction queue. The branch prediction unit, which allows the processor to begin actually fetching and processing instructions before the outcome of a branch instruction is determined. Obviously for microprocessors with long pipelines, successful branch prediction allows the processor to fetch and execute speculative instructions over the predicted path without stalling the pipeline. So when a prediction isn't successful though, Nahalem will just cancel the work that's already been done by the microoperation and as long as the entire path that has uh, been issued by that microoperation. Next is the branch target buffer. Nahalem improves branch handling in several ways. The BDB has been increased in size to improve accuracy of branch predictions as compared to uh, predecessor versions. Further hardware enhancements improve the handling of branch mispredictions by expediting resource reclaiming so that the front end wouldn't have to wait to decode instructions in an architectured code path while resources were being allocated to execute mispredicted code paths. Instead, the new micro-op stream, it can actually start forward progress as soon as the front end decodes the instruction and the architectured code path has been resolved. Another major component of the front-end pipeline is the micro-infusion. The instruction decoder supports micro-fusion uh, to improve pipeline front-end throughput, and uh, it also increases the effective size of the queues in the schedule and reorder buffer. So micro-fusion fuses multiple micro-operations from the same instruction into a single complex micro-op. Uh, the complex micro-op is then dispatched in the out-of-order execution core. This reduces power consumption as the micro operation represents more work in a smaller format and it also reduces uh, the overall bit toggling in the machine for a given amount of work. It, it virtually increases the amount of storage in the out of order execution engine and many instructions provide register and memory flavors. The flavor involving a memory operand will decode into a longer flow of micro ops than the register version. Microinfusion enables software to use memory to register operations to express the actual program behavior without really worrying about a loss of decoder bandwidth. That kind of ties in nicely with macroinfusion. Uh, so the IDU supports macroinfusion, which translates adjacent macro instructions into a single micro-op if possible. So macrofusion allows logical compare test instructions to be combined with adjacent conditional jump instructions into one micro-operation. The next major component of the pipeline is the execution engine, which consists of the register rename and allocation unit, the reorder buffer, the unified reservation station, uh, and the memory order buffer. The EE in the HOLM selects micro-operations from the upstream IDQ and dynamically schedules them for dispatching and execution by the execution units downstream. The EE is dynamically scheduled and it's out of order. That's superscalar pipeline, which allows micro ops to use available execution units in parallel when correctness and code semantics are not violated. So the uh, execution engine scheduler can dispatch up to six micro operations in one clock cycle through the six dispatch ports to the execution unit. There are several functional units arranged in three clusters for integer floating point and SIMD operations. 
And finally, four micro-ups can retire in one cycle, which is the same as the Nihilum's predecessor cores. The register rename and allocation unit, it allocates EE resources to micro-ops in the IDQ and moves them to the execution engine. Uh, the reorder buffer, obviously, it will track all micro-operations in flight. The URS has the ability to queue up to 36 micro-operations and schedules and dispatches ready micro-ops to the available execution units. And finally, the memory order buffer supports speculative and out-of-order loads and stores and also ensures that writes to memory take place in the right order and with the right data. So to kind of summarize how an instruction will flow through a Nahalem architecture a CPU, it goes through these five primary stages of fetch, decode, optimize, execute, and write. First, we fetch the instruction from the layer 2 cache. Then we decode the instruction, and this is where macro fusion occurs and also where branch prediction is attempted. We optimize those instructions where we attempt to do the micro fusing so that multiple micro operations can be fused into a single one. We execute the instruction through the four FPUs, the multiply, divide, store, load, and three ALUs. And then finally, we write our result back to memory. And again, the memory order buffer will ensure in order writing, and um, results are written to a private layer one and layer two cache. So these are the references that I used with my presentation. And next is Greg Robinson, who will be discussing the Turbo Boost feature on the Core i7. Hello, I'm Greg Robinson, and I'm going to discuss Nehalem's PCU and Turbo Boost technology. The implementation of Nehalem's Turbo Boost technology starts with the PCU or power control unit. Architects used over 1 million transistors to include the microcontroller on the die. The PCU contains its own embedded firmware which can take inputs on temperature, current, power, and OS requests. Having each of these data points allows the PCU to more easily determine its power distribution over each of the cores. As you can see from the diagram, each core gets its own PLL, which allows for the dynamic variance of clock speed among the cores. This is how Intel is trying to take on the bottleneck problem of parallel tasks in Andal's law. The PCU is able to determine which tasks are going to require greater clock speed, and then tell the PLLs of the individual cores what clock speed is required for the tasks running on each core, ensuring that the tasks with the greater cycle times get higher clock speeds, which should somewhat mitigate the bottleneck problem caused by those cycle-heavy tasks. What's also new to the game is having individual power gates for each core on the die. Multi-core processors in the past had cores that had to all run on the same voltage, which led to a greater amount of leakage power on idle cores. However, by having individual power gates, the Halem cores can be shut off when they are in an active state, leading to lower leakage power. In the past, processors had to rely on multiple power planes in order to have this type of control of individual cores, which drove up motherboard cost and complexity. By using an old on-die PCU, the time it takes to increase and decrease voltage to cores is significantly faster than any other off-die methods, which leads to more efficient power management. By having a PCU on the die along with individual core power gates, Intel has been able to effectively implement a new version of its turbo mode. In past implementations, Intel has had issues with effective turbo mode utilization due to issues with how the operating system has used its processors. Intel's turbo mode used to be set up in a way that would initialize once the processor saw an idle core that wasn't using its power, power effectively. So if an idle core was detected, then more power would be issued to the active core in order to increase its clock speed. However, the issue that Intel ran into was that Windows Vista would notoriously either move a single thread to multiple cores or would always continue to create additional threads to keep each core in the processor active. Due to this issue, the turbo mode on older processors was rarely utilized because the processor's cores hardly ever becoming idle. However, this has all changed on Intel's Nehalem processor. Turbo mode is now less dependent on the core's idleness and more dependent on the thermal design point of the processor. Turbo mode can be enabled when all the cores are idle, when some of the cores are idle, or even when none of the cores are idle. Turbo mode is able to increase active cores by a single clock step, which is 133 MHz, as long as the thermal design point has been reached. Turbo mode can even increase a single core by two clock steps, or 266 MHz, if all other cores are inactive. Nehalem's Turbo Boost technology is very dependent on several pieces of Nehalem architecture. Sensors within each of the cores alert the power control unit of the core temperature, current, and power. The PCU is then able to increase or decrease the voltage of PLLs in each core based on the data provided by these sensors. 
The PCU can also turn off power gates to inactive cores to prevent leakage power and prevent the chip's temperature from reaching the TDP. In this slide, you can see TurboBoost in action. In this example, TurboBoost has effectively increased the clock speed of two cores by disabling two inactive cores. In this example, each core would get a clock speed boost of 133 MHz. Now we're going to take a look at some turbo boost metrics generated from the experiment provided by the academic article Evaluation the Intel Core i7 Turbo Boost Feature. For this experiment, two test sets were constructed from subsets of the SPEC CPU 2006 benchmarks. From these benchmarks, four categories of applications were tested. Two memory intensive floating point applications, two memory intensive integer applications, two CPU intensive floating point applications, and two CPU intensive integer applications. All possible pairs of the four applications were run using one pair per experiment. The pairs of applications were executed first on the same physical core and then on separate cores. Pairs of applications were also executed with and without TurboBoost activated and the speedup was calculated. For each test, one application in the pair was identified as the principal application and the second was identified as the interfering application. This experiment yielded four bar graphs. Figure A and B on the left show the speedup results of set one, when the two applications were executing on the same cores and different cores. Figure A and B on the right show the speedup results of set two under the same circumstances. The shading of each bar reveals the interfering application that was executing when the particular speedup result was achieved. For example, in figure A of set two, the greatest speed up of 8.5% was achieved when a CPU intensive floating point application was being interfered with by a memory intensive integer application on the same core. As you can see, each test result shows a positive speed up when TurboBoost was active. Using the experiment's test results, the conclusion stated that TurboBoost can provide on average up to a 6% reduction in execution time. The study also found that in all cases, TurboBoost enhanced performance. And here are my Turbo Boost references. Now I'm going to pass it off to Matt Burrow, where he's going to talk about Nehalem's memory hierarchy. Hello, I'm Matt Burrow, and I'm going to discuss the i7's memory hierarchy. Here we can see the Nehalem i7 die. Regions of the die not used for cache or memory are grayed out. Each of the four cores contains its own L1 and L2 caches. The L1 cache is split into separate instruction and data caches. There's also an L3 cache that is shared between the cores. Intel clearly spent a lot of die real estate on the memory hierarchy. The memory controller uses about 11% of the space on the die. The four L1 data caches together take up 2% of the die. The L1 instruction cache uses 1% total, while the L2s consume about 3%. Finally, the L3 occupies nearly 27% of the space on the die. Together, cache makes up 33% of the die area, or 44% if the memory controller is included. Unlike all previous Intel processor designs, the Nehalem features an integrated memory controller. This eliminates the need to route memory accesses through the front side bus to the north bridge, which increases bandwidth and decreases latency. Each Nehalem chip has three 64-bit channels, which support 1.333 gigatransfers per second between the controller and RAM. It has a maximum bandwidth of 32 gigabytes per second and allows 10 outstanding data misses plus six instruction misses. Since the memory controller is built into the Nehalem's die, Multiprocessor systems have non-uniform memory access times. Here are the details of the Nehalem's cache. As one would expect, the L1 instruction cache is highly optimized for access time using 4-way set associativity, while L3's 16-way associativity is better for hit rate. L1 data and L2 strike a balance between the two with their 8-way set associativity. All cache levels are right back and have 64-byte cache lines. The L2 cache excludes the contents of the L1 cache. L3 is inclusive of L1 instruction, L1 data, and L2 caches for performance, so not every L1 and L2 cache needs to be searched on an L3 miss. The L3 cache uses core valid bits for each cache line to determine which core contains a valid copy of that line. These bits are used to determine which cores need to be snooped for modifications when being accessed by another core. For cache coherence, the Nehalem uses the MESIF protocol, which is a variation on the MESI protocol that includes a forwarding state between three or more processors. Intel's design documents specify the access latencies of the i7's caches as 4, 10, and 35 to 40 cycles for the L1, L2, and L3 respectively. 
L3 access times can vary depending on the frequency of the core accessing the cache compared to the frequency of other subsystems on the die, known as the uncore. In a paper for the 2009 Conference on Parallel Architectures and Compilation Techniques, researchers from the Dresden University of Technology tested the latencies of caches on real hardware. The results are in parentheses. Access times for Intel's previous core generations are shown on the right, as well as a recent AMD CPU. While the Nehalem has added one cycle to L1 times, L2 times have dropped. It should be noted that the L2 cache on the Nehalem is considerably smaller than past Intel core processors. This is possible because the earlier Intel core processors did not contain an L3 cache, with the exception of the Xeon 7400, which was the last Intel processor in the Penryn microarchitecture that preceded Nehalem. This chart, from a paper presented at the 2009 International Supercomputing Conference, compares the cache and memory latency of a system running two Penryn Harpertown E5472 3GHz processors and a system with two Nehalem X5570 2.93 GHz processors. The Harpertown is a Xeon similar to the Core 2 Quad and has four cores on each CPU. The Nehalem is a Xeon with four cores plus four threads on each CPU. Both CPUs have 32 kilobytes of L1 instruction and 32 kilobytes of L1 data cache per core. The Harpertown also has 12 megabytes of L2 cache shared between the cores, compared to the Nehalem's 256 kilobyte of L2 cache per core and an additional 8 megabytes shared L3. The graph chart's memory accesses for both systems when 1, 2, 4, and 8 cores were running the Stream Memory Benchmark program. The Nehalem also includes a line showing the latency of running 16 copies of the program using SMT on each core. The data access times are a series of plateaus that correspond to the sizes of each level of cache. The first plateau ends at 32 kilobytes for each test, the size of each core's L1 cache, except the 16 instance version on the Nehalem. This is because the two threads on each core share the L1 cache, effectively halving it. Here, the speed of the L1 cache is fairly similar between both generations, with latencies around 2 nanoseconds. The second tier of cache is shorter for the Nehalem, which only has 256 kilobytes per core, compared to the 8 megabyte shared Harpertown L2 cache. However, the Nehalem's L2 is approximately 33% faster than the Harpertown. Since the Harpertown does not contain a third level cache, it was optimized to avoid misses to main memory, not for speed. Toward the end of the graph, all the cache has been exhausted and the latencies to memory are shown. Here, the Nehalem shows a great improvement over the Harpertown. With three channels of PC3 10600 memory per socket, the Nehalem has a theoretical maximum bandwidth of 32 gigabytes per second per processor. The Harpertown uses PC2 6400 memory with one channel per processor, delivering up to 12.8 gigabytes per second per socket. With one instance of the benchmark running, the Nehalem is 27% faster than the Harpertown. The Nehalem also handles multiple instances of the program better than the Harpertown, with 36% lower latency in the 8 core comparison. Even the 16 SMT test is 16% faster than Harpertown's single instance test, and 29% faster than its 8-way test. Intel put a lot of effort into improving memory performance over past generations of chips. These are the references for the memory slides. Next, Derek will discuss QPI. Thanks, Matt. Quick Path Interconnect, better known as QPI, was first developed by Intel back in 2008. The technology was created to replace the older Frontside Bus. Frontside Bus had been around for a while and allowed different components to talk to each other over a single bus. This slide demonstrates how older Intel architectures worked, where each processor would talk over a single bus to the other components in the system. This single bus caused two problems. The first problem being newer processors were getting faster and faster. The faster the processors were getting, the more instructions they could process per second. The bus was unable to feed the processor enough instructions to keep it busy for every single cycle, causing the processors to have to wait for instructions to be fetched or data to be fetched from memory. The second problem being only a certain number of devices can use the bus at the same time. Depending on the algorithm used for signaling, anywhere from one to four devices can send data down the bus at one time. Intel's newest architecture is not a bus at all. It consists of different point-to-point -point links between different components in the system allowing each to talk over a pair of wires. 
Each wire has a transmit and receive, allowing bilateral communication between each device. Like most technologies, each QPI architecture is not the same. The spec is designed to run at three different frequencies, 2.4 GHz, 2.93 GHz, or 3.2 GHz. The frequency the link runs at is depending on the device itself. For example, the Intel Core i7-980X Extreme Edition is able to run at 3.2 GHz due to its increased clock speed, whereas some of the Xeon processors are only able to run at the slower 2.4 GHz frequency due to their lower clock speed. Intel's newest architecture is not a bus at all. It consists of different point-to-point -point links between different components in the system allowing each to talk over a pair of wires. Each wire has a transmit and receive allowing bilateral communication between each device. Like most technologies, each QPI architecture is not the same. The spec is designed to run at three different frequencies, 2.4 GHz, 2.93 GHz, or 3.2 GHz. The frequency the link runs at is depending on the device itself. For example, the Intel Core i7-980X Extreme Edition is able to run at 3.2 GHz due to its increased clock speed, whereas some of the Xeon processors are only able to run at the slower 2.4 GHz frequency due to their lower clock speed. The Quick Path interface is made up of four different layers, physical, link, routing, and protocol. It's comparable to a network stack where messages move up the stack. The physical layer is responsible for monitoring the electrical signals sent on each wire and converting them to data to send up to the layers above. The link layer is responsible for error correction and flow control. Flow control is handled by a unit called FLIT or flow control unit. Flow control unit has 8 bits of CRC for every 72 bits of data. If the CRC does not match, a retransmission is sent for the device on the other side to resend the corrupted data. The routing layer is responsible for delivering data to a destination that is not directly connected to the device. If the message is destined for the local device, it is sent to the protocol layer. If it is destined for a different device, it is sent to the routing agent to send it further down the line. The protocol layer is responsible for multiple actions, the two most important being packet reassembly and system functions. The protocol layer reassembles all of the flits that were sent in the link stage. The protocol layer is also responsible for the system level functions, such as interrupts, memory mapped I.O., and locking. As you can see by this chart, Intel's quick path technology is quite a bit faster than the older front side bus. Intel claims a throughput of 25.6 gigabits a second when running at 3.2 gigahertz and 19.2 gigabits a second when running at 2.4 gigahertz. The formula to calculate the speed is defined as the operating frequency times bits per clock cycle times the width times the payload over the flits bits times the number of QPI links divided by 8. In our example we would multiply 3.2 times 2 times 20 which is the width described by Intel times 64, which is the payload length, divided by 80, which is the payload, plus 8 for the error correction, plus 8 for header, times 2, divided by 8. 
and that would give us 25.6 gigabits. I hope you enjoyed our presentation on the technologies used by the Intel Core i7. Thank you.